Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all, um, especially because today we are going to be diving into candida overgrowth, specifically around testing. And I was honestly blown away by the number of questions that we got about candida. As you know, I did um, another one of these Ask Me Anythings back in March. So if you missed that, we talked about diet for about 15 minutes. And um, the testing question is one of the biggest questions that I get. So if you are here and you have been consistently frustrated by the fact that you get these varying answers from not only just the internet, but also practitioners. So for example, one of the biggest challenges, and I don't know if any of you have experienced this, so please feel free to share that in the comments, but there is a problem where people will have very clear symptoms and issues that look like a fungal problem. So fungal can also include candida albicans because candida and other candida species and other fungal organisms are all a part of the of sort of like fungal so have very clear symptoms. Maybe you get thrush or you have vaginal yeast infections or you get skin infections that turn out like tinea versicolor to actually be fungal infections of the skin. And yet you will do, for example, stool testing and the stool testing will look clear of candida. And so your practitioner will say, no, you actually don't have a candida problem, which leaves you feeling really perplexed. And believe it or not, um, we're gonna talk about different testing options today. So if you have actually tried any different tests and had this sort of similar experience where you're confused as to why the results didn't necessarily show fungus, or for example, maybe you had a stool test that did show that you had some fungal overgrowth and yet, the results were within the normal range. And so again, it was not addressed because it appears to be normal when in reality it may not be. So I want to go through a variety of this, um, these different situations with you so that you can make the best decision for yourself and also ask for the best solutions with whomever your practitioner is. So just to bring you guys up to speed in case this is your first time ever tuning into one of these Ask Me Anythings and you really haven't ever paid attention to or tuned into any of the Healthy Skin Show um, podcast episodes, I am a clinical nutritionist. I've been working in this field of health and wellness as a nutritionist since 2017. I have a master's degree in human nutrition and I'm also... Um, a CNS, which is the National Certified Nutrition Specialist, um, I guess, certification for the United States is like a nationwide certification. And I'm also licensed in the state that my practice resides. Um, and so I've had a lot of experience, not only personally dealing with chronic skin issues, but also chronic gut issues. So we see both in my practice, we work with clients, myself and my associate, we work with clients privately all over the world who are really looking for answers, especially when their doctor doesn't quite know what to do or their um, functional or integrative practitioner doesn't really have that much experience with skin issues or the kind of cookie cutter protocols that you're used to using on people who just have gut problems or autoimmune issues don't actually work on their particular skin issues. So we're really well versed in folks who unfortunately have been failed by other providers because they just don't understand that skin issues in and of themselves are pretty interesting and different beast. It's not just an autoimmune issue. It's not just um, a gut problem and treating them as such oftentimes doesn't yield the results that people think they will. So in terms of testing for fungal overgrowth or candida overgrowth, there's a couple of things that you need to know. Number one, there is no gold standard test for candida or fungal overgrowth. Part of the reason that that is, is because there are different organisms and tests will look for some things and it won't look for other things. So nothing is foolproof. And to be fair, most testing is like that. You can't just usually go 100% off of a test. You need to consider 
the various elements and aspects of your specific case history. That should be factored in. If, for example, as I said earlier, if you have fungal overgrowth in the sense that you get thrush occasionally, like every time you get antibiotics, you get thrush. So that's like an infection in the mouth and down the esophagus of candida overgrowth. You have a candida problem. You should antibiotics should not be the the the, the thing that trips that into coming into existence. Um, or if every time you take antibiotics, or maybe it's not even that, you eat too much sugar or whatever, you end up with a vaginal yeast infection or jock itch or something like that. That means that your gut microbiome is out of balance and it doesn't take a whole lot for that yeast to really show itself. And so the second problem that we have is that by not relying to some weighted degree on our symptoms and on the clinical picture of our case, especially if you have used certain medications that could potentially make it more likely that you would develop candida overgrowth or fungal overgrowth, um, I think that's where we're really missing an element. And then I, I didn't, I did say two things, but I think there's a third component to this in that when you have fungal or candida overgrowth, the overgrowth does not begin in your large intestine. Candida and fungal organisms normally live in the small intestine. So they're higher up. And the, it's more difficult for us to test the small intestine as a whole. And so for a stool test, for example, to even show positive in any way, shape or form. So I'm talking about even just the presence of there being some fungal organisms. And depending on the type of stool test, it could decide that, oh, it's a rare occurrence, right? But there was some present, there just wasn't a lot. Or there was the presence of organisms, but it was, it was still within normal range, or you were just high. The issue did not originate in the large intestine. Those tests are large intestine tests. The issue originated farther up in the small intestine, which is much more difficult for us to really test. In general, the same goes for SIBO. For those of you who checked out the recent episode that I did um, interviewing Dr. Allison Seebecker on small intestine bacterial overgrowth, she also acknowledged there's a re it's really tricky to test what's going on in the small intestine. We have options, but we're not 100% there. And when it comes to fungal overgrowth, if we know that that's the place where the fungus or candida normally live, and now we're starting to see it show up on a large intestine test, it likely means that it has overgrown the small intestine to the point where now it can be picked up on a large intestine test. So likely you do have small intestine fungal overgrowth or CFO, um, as well as large intestine fungal overgrowth. Now, it's also possible, as I mentioned, to have a stool test that says that there's no candida present. Does that mean that you don't have candida overgrowth or some sort of fungal overgrowth? And I use both of these interchangeably because not all forms of can, um, fungus are candida. You might see candida species listed on a test, candida albicans, but there's also other forms of fungal um, organisms like geotrichum, rhodoterula that can show up. And obviously we wouldn't call them candida because that's not what they are, they're, but they're in the fungal family. And so I, I, number one would caution you from relying entirely on stool test results. Number two, the spit test is not clinically significant. There's no way that you can tell that you have fungal overgrowth solely from a spit test. So I would not necessarily use that. I realize it's free and that's wonderful. I'm not against free tools and free tests when they work and when they give us an, a really good inkling of what's going on, but I really haven't seen that a stool test, or excuse me, a spit test where you spit into a glass and you look at, does the, does the spit start to grow legs down in the water? I mean, it's just, it's not, there's nothing you can gain from that, unfortunately. Um, the th other type of testing that you might see discussed online, and in fact, I actually did discuss this and the uh, it was um, 
was an episode back in the fall about candida testing was organic acid testing. So organic acid testing are urinary tests where they look for certain mm, byproducts of different acids within the urine. And there are a few that they can test your urine for that are specific waste products of certain organisms, one of which is Candida albicans. It's called arabnose or arabnic um, acid. And those also are not foolproof. And I can actually, I can't show you, but I actually saw a client earlier today who showed on a stool test that she had two different types of candida. So she was high for candida albicans and then um, showed the presence of other candida species. But when we looked at her organic acid test that was done at the same exact time, the um, arabinose was actually with not only within range of being normal, it was actually low. So you cannot, this is the, the reason why you can see the testing is not perfect. And when we looked at her case, it made a great deal of sense that candida overgrowth was a factor for her. So for example, some things that are obvious that could put you at greater risk for fungal overgrowth include things like lots of antibiotic use. Um, you could have been on hormonal birth control pills for a really long time. That also can change the pH of um, the uh, uterus and the um, vagina area. And so that can also be a factor. Um, we also have issues where uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it because I did talk about candida diet, but obviously eating a diet that's heavily um, of processed carbs, lots of sugar, processed foods does not help. That's not a surefire thing that you're going to end up with fungal overgrowth, but it certainly does not help. If you also have a history of drinking a lot of alcohol, that is likely a factor because it does, first of all, alcohol is a very high source of yeast, um, especially with things like beer where they use brewer's yeast in order to make it. So you have a high exposure to something called Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's brewer's yeast. And so that can be a factor as well. So you want to think about your history and your relationship with alcohol. If you once did drink heavily, that may be something that your that kind of burden of what it's created within the GI tract may still be present for you. Um, other factors include medications that are oftentimes used to treat skin issues. So not everyone is using prednisone and um, more oral doses of steroids, but steroids in general do lower our body's defenses to be able to contain fungal organisms, um, especially on the skin. Um, but I do think that it's worthwhile to consider if you have a long history of steroid use, that can be a factor. And then there are some biologic drugs that um, especially when it comes to psoriasis. Psoriasis um, uses certain drugs and you can actually read in the um, kind of side effect area and things that you need to be cautious of that you can develop candidiasis or candida infection. So because of what that drug is suppressing, that particular cytokine is important for the protection against fungal organisms. So when we suppress it, because it also happens to suppress the symptoms of psoriasis, it can put us at unfortunately a greater risk for fungal organisms to get overrun within, I always consider the GI tract sort of the, the headquarters of what may then translate out to other microbiomes. So typically if you are, especially developing skin infections that um, are connected to, that are found to be fungal in nature. So for example, your um, dermatologist can do um, a culture. Cultures aren't always great for fungal overgrowth, but they can very quickly do something known as a KOH prep. And that test is doing like a scraping of the skin and they then stain it and put it under a microscope. And they can very quickly in office tell you whether there is um, an overgrowth of fungal organisms on the skin. But things like tinea versicolor, for example, are an absolute sign of a fungal overgrowth on the skin. And so those things, if you do have a skin issue, there is a high likelihood, especially if you've had longstanding 
um, problems with um, skin problems, gut problems, et cetera, that it, there's a high likelihood that you also have internal fungal overgrowth. So those are things to consider. I unfortunately cannot tell you if there are classical symptoms to candida overgrowth in terms of GI symptoms, because I've had clients who were extremely constipated, had a lot of gas and bloating. And then I have other clients that have diarrhea and they have no bloating, but they have gas. It's all over the place. But anytime you do have those symptoms, you want to consider what's going on in the GI tract. I will caution you. Most people do not just have candida overgrowth. And I share that because there's this high propensity within the wellness world to look for the one thing that's wrong. And What's tricky about that is that most things don't happen in a vacuum. Yes, it's possible that you went someplace and you got exposed to this one thing and you ended up with an infection. But for most people, that's not the case. So as I said, if for example, like me, I have an issue where my dad was a doctor. So as a kid, I got a lot of antibiotics and that slowly depleted my gut microbiome. And even to this day, it's something that I still struggle with, with a more depleted gut microbiome. And as a result, it makes me more likely to have fungal overgrowth issues because our gut commensal bacteria are there to help keep the fungal organisms in check. And when we don't have enough of them, that can potentially create the right environment for candida and other fungal organisms to overgrow. The other type of instances can be when you have a significant mold exposure. And that mold exposure could be in your home, could be your car, could be your place of work. And being in that fungally environment can influence your own gut microbiome. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you worked in a really moldy place for a year and maybe five years down the road, you're like, why would that be? Um, important to know because it set the stage for an entire year of influencing your gut microbiome. And if you didn't do anything about it, then it's likely that it may still be a factor that the yeast overgrowth may have in, been initiated at that time and it didn't necessarily just go back. So it's important to keep all of this in mind. This is where, again, it becomes really, really um, complex. So in terms of questions, like I have some people here are like, hey, I'm suffering from urticaria and um, bowel issues of pain, bloating, diarrhea, and, and constipation, but it's a little bit more like on the loose side, probably where you might feel like you're not, you haven't fully gone to the bathroom or that the that you're going in smaller stints and it's harder. But um, anyway, the point is that fungal organisms can create issues where we have S, uh, um, elevations in histamine. And again, that's sort of like can be sometimes correlated to mold exposure. Um, but it, it again, we can't just go off of that. You want to really look through your history and say, is fungal over overgrowth a part of this? Because if you're only looking for the one thing and you ignore everything else because you're trying to find the one thing, we can miss really important clues that while the fungal overgrowth may be a piece of it, it may not be all of it. So Emily, you're saying that um, you have a lot of uh, antibiotic history in your past, which really messed things up badly. A hundred percent. That absolutely can be the case. I also know some individuals who have had massive exposures to antibiotics and have like a huge amount of um, like just bacterial overgrowth still in their GI tract and they don't have candida issues. But you can also have too much bacteria and too much can, um, fungus and candida. So I don't want anyone to walk away from this thinking that it's just like one thing or the other thing. We can have a variety of issues. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So. For example, I consider, so in talking about like testing, right? And I said, we want to correlate this to your history. So you're going to need to think about mold exposures, your antibiotic history, birth control history, steroid history, um, biologic drug history. And if those specific drugs actually have any interaction with candida and other fungal organisms. But 
there are also some spots I consider them kind of like I call them like fungally hot spots and I I'm gonna be entirely upfront with you guys I don't have any science to necessarily back this up it's just patterns that I've seen clinically so there are like fungal hot spots and they usually are areas where we sweat they tend to be more damp um, so places like that can include around the eyes into the scalp, especially the back of the neck, right? We, a lot of times when you sweat, your neck, you'll sweat around your neck, the ears, the mouth, especially because candida is actually the number one organism in terms of if you get an infection in the mouth and especially around the lips, candida is the actual number one organism. It doesn't mean that that means it's the only thing that you can get that can be causing the infection. Um, Staph aureus is second, but we should consider the fact this is a damp area. So your armpits, under the breast, in the groin area, the feet, the back of the knees, the, the inside of the elbows, um, and even the insides of the wrists can be kind of a fungally area. So those are kind of my fungal hot spots. I actually do have an episode on this that I've done for the Healthy Skin Show, and I'm happy to share. But um, it, it is helpful to know as you go through your case, um, we want to find a balance, like I said, between what tests you choose to do and other symptoms and um, experiences that you have had, not just now, but also in the past. Um, Emily also was, you were asking about um, ear infections. Um, I do have an entire episode on ear issues. Uh, that was back in, I think, September, October of 2023. I'm happy to like share some of these in the chat afterwards. I can go through and grab some of the um, the URLs for you because we do have them here on YouTube. Um, the other thing I just, because Jacqueline asked, are there any supplements to take when having candida overgrowth that are not high in salicylates? So first of all, salicylates, salicylates, same thing. <laughs> Depends on who pronounces it and how you pronounce it. Um, the first thing is, I do want to say this, Jacqueline, if you have a salicylate issue, you have a functional glycine deficiency period. So you need to address that. That is not an issue to allow to continue because it means that your body doesn't have an ample enough supply, number one, of glycine. Glycine is an amino acid. You oftentimes cannot increase the amount in the body efficiently when you're trying to do it with food-based options. I hate to say this, I've, I've tried. I've tried with clients and eventually I realized the most effective way to deal with it is actually to supplement with glycine on its own. So that's number one. Number two, and that with time, believe it or not, within four to six weeks, if you get your glycine level up pretty good, you should be good with salicylates unless you actually have an actual allergy to it. Most people do not have an actual allergy. When we develop salicylate sensitivity, it is also not a gut problem. It is processed in phase two liver detox down the glycine conjugation pathway. And that's one reason why, and I actually pinned it um, here, the P2 detox balance is specifically made to support that phase two liver detox which is so great. And it also just provides the exact nutrients that your body needs in order to really make phase two liver detox run because what overloads your liver, like all of these times we talk about, oh my gosh, well, candida is producing alcohol and we have all these gut organisms, what happens to their waste products, it all all of the benzoates and other things, some of it is urinated and pooped out, but a lot of it has to end up going to the liver. And it doesn't go through phase one, it goes through phase two liver detox, which is pretty much almost entirely nutrient dependent. And if there is a really high load, that will start to eat away at the supplies that we have to be able to process and package things to be able to then get them out. And so we oftentimes can be reactive to herbs. Herbs can drive up phase one, which again, further overloads phase two, or B vitamins, which can also complicate things. And so this formula is really simple. It's very specific nutrients that phase two liver detox pathways need, including that glycine pathway. So it's a really beautiful product that 
I mean, most people tolerate extremely well and within a few weeks actually notice a really sizable difference in how they're able to tolerate things. So I definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, it, 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 before you start working on any gut things, you always want to support phase two liver detox because as you begin to deal with anything like candida or gut microbes that are more um, inflammatory and overgrown, the waste products increase. So you already have an over too much of those waste products, right? And this is in addition to everything else that your liver has to do on a daily basis. But now it's increased because of the amount of organisms that are present, right? Because it has to deal with those waste products. But when you start to kill those organisms, now the amount of toxins that it has to deal with increases even more. So that a lot of times is why people actually react to those supplements. So doing a good like four to six weeks ahead of time of really nutritionally supporting your liver. That does not include castor oil packs, coffee enemas, because they do not, while they can be maybe helpful for phase three in excretion, they do not add any nutrients to phase two. There is nothing from either of them that will increase phase two. And actually coffee enemas increase phase one, which as I said, excess amount of phase one has to go through phase two. So if you've got a ton coming into phase two and now you increase phase one, you've got this huge, huge burden that phase two just can't keep up with. So super, super critical. Um, and then also like Elizabeth, you shared that you're working from the bottom of the pyramid and you're starting to, so I have a priority pyramid in terms of how I figured out we start to work with um, different skin issues and whatnot. And so with the priority pyramid, as you, you noticed, you're starting to feel much better, which is awesome. So still having very dark circles under the eyes, is that linked to fungal issues? It can be. It can also be a sign that you're really tired. That's, that's another factor. But I always think about with the eyes, is there a potential mold issue in the environment? I think that's definitely worth considering um, because I'm not a big proponent of going down the rabbit hole of trying to eliminate foods and restricting the diet more and more because ultimately at the end of the day we want to be able to regain the ability to expand the diet that was something I talked about in the last ask me anything that I thought was super super important um, so Emily you had asked like what can we do if we live in a moldy area like certain states with humid weather well one thing you can do is have a dehumidifier available in your home in certain areas if you do have central air they usually have a dehumidifier added into that so that can be helpful the other problem and it's less so about humid areas per se but it's about maintaining a certain level of humidity um, that protects i shouldn't even say that you want to make sure that there are no leaks right? That's really, really crucial. So there's no leaks under your sink. There's no leaks in your roof. There's no leaks around the windows. There's no leaks in the shower that could be um, a real uh, trigger for mold growth. That is really, really important. Um, I've also made a habit too of, um, you can buy these squeegees like on Amazon or whatever, but after I get out of the shower, when I'm done, I squeegee down all of the tiles and the glass and everything to try to get all the water into the drain and then, and then any areas where it's standing using a towel to kind of wipe it up because just letting it air dry especially if it's if you are in i mean i have clients that live in california where it's well before all of these atmospheric rivers and everything was extremely dry and generally is very dry they have found that they have mold in their bathrooms because it didn't have good ventilation and so unfortunately, I think that could be the bigger factor is to consider how do you maintain your home space in such a way that you're not exposing yourself to um, excess amounts of mold that could be harmful. I don't know that it is possible to be 100% mold free. The other thing to consider is that mold can hide in air ducts. It can also hide in condensers for AC units. So if you suspect there's an issue where say, if you constantly sleep in your air conditioned home and you seem like when you sleep or you're under the vents, things get worse. 
Um, I would definitely get the vents checked and I would also get the air conditioning units checked as well for mold. Um, so I hope that this is helpful. I think that um, there's a lot to dig into this area. Somebody mentioned also about the carnivore diet. I'm not a huge fan of the carnivore diet. I can see the benefits and I am a big proponent of higher protein and more nutrient dense foods, which the carnivore diet does definitely add, but I just will caution anyone. Um, a lot of the stool tests that I've seen and the people that I've worked with who've done carnivore for longer than like I would say four to six months have really significant depletions in the GI tract, which makes it makes it then difficult to reintroduce plant foods and to get other helpful um, like butyrate and other short chain fatty acid production, et cetera, going in the GI tract again, which also it helps in their anti-inflammatory nature of things. Um, so I would just caution you with that. You really can't starve yeast. That was something that I had shared in a previous episode. Um, and also in that last candida diet, ask me anything. I don't believe in the candida diet. Candida are like cockroaches. Fungus is like cockroaches. It will outlast a lot of things. You can think you're starving it as much as you want, but most people will acknowledge that when they try to reintroduce all their old foods after attempting to starve it, the symptoms begin to come back after a period of time. And it's because those organisms were able to just outlast you. So I think it's better in my perspective to try to deal with it and get the GI tract rebalanced instead of taking to really what can be for some very extreme and difficult measures, attempting to outrun something that honestly really has a lot of staying power. <laughs> it's very determined to hang around and overgrow because it's an opportunistic organism that is by nature a part of our commensal gut microbiome. It should be there, just not overgrown. And so we want to figure out the reasons that it's going on, the ways to rebalance it that are sensible, that are sustainable, and that help provide you not only with a good quality of life, but also allow you the flexibility to be able to take trips with your family and whatnot. So anyway, I hope that this is helpful. Um, I am, I love this topic. I promise that I will do another one of these Ask Me Anythings very soon. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me. And if you have any questions after this, leave them in the comments. As I shared that um, the one supplement, as everybody had asked, the one supplement that I um, really do use with all of my clients, but especially those who have candida and fungal overgrowth is the P2 detox balance because it has no herbs, has no B vitamins. It is really there to support the pathways that get incredibly over, like on overdrive and really are overloaded because of what's happening in the GI tract. Um, so it's incredibly beneficial. And um, yes, so with psoriasis too, I guess I should knock out a couple of more of these questions since I have a moment. Um, so psoriasis, people with psoriasis, I don't have like definitive data on this. I've seen some studies that have correlated this, but I think it we're still waiting for more research. But I have seen clinically that folks with psoriasis tend to have much more significant fungal overgrowth than other, generally speaking, some of the other types of skin issues that I've worked on. Um, and some people have even noticed, like if they use antifungal shampoos or soaps on their plaques and let it sit for like two or three minutes in the shower before rinsing it off, that with time that can even be helpful. It's not like the underlying fix, but that can sometimes be helpful. Um, I don't believe that sweeteners and honestly, so monk fruit, I don't, when you say like certain sweeteners are absorbed in the intestines, um, I'm not sure if you're speaking about like whether we absorb them nutritionally or or whatnot, but like erythritol is a sugar alcohol, so it can cause it. It does have some sugar in it, um, and it can cause for some people GI issues, especially if you have a lot of gut dysbiosis and certain organisms that like to ferment erythritol and other sugar alcohols. But if you can tolerate it, it's fine. Stevia and monk fruit do not have any glycemic index, so they taste sweet. They also have different taste profiles as well, but they taste sweet, but they don't have a glycemic index associated with them. 
I don't necessarily mind either. I would say probably stevia and monk fruit would be the least triggering for somebody who has fungal overgrowth. Um, but I would say this, like be mindful of how much sweetener you're using in general. Try to vary what you're getting. Don't lean really hard and put tons of things in everything you eat. Try to find other opportunities to shift your diet in a sensible way. I'm not a fan of people that just cut all sugar and all sweet out. We do need a balance of flavors. Um, and I also don't mind that clients eat things like berries, um, and sweet potatoes and, and carrots and other things that oftentimes are banned on a lot of these candida diets. I don't find that to be sustainable. But I'll be honest, I don't think if you're having a little bit of erythritol or a bit of stevia or a bit of monk fruit that that's your culprit behind candida. You got another problem that's causing that. And looking at those, you're not really looking at the bigger picture of what may have led to this situation and what is sustaining it. I don't, I'm not going to nitpick people's diets. It, with the exception of where somebody would be eating massive amounts of processed carbs, lots of sugar, having dessert after every single meal, eating like refined carbs for breakfast, like it's the majority of the meal, right? That's a bit of a different story. But if you're making really sensible choices where probably, you know, you're having 30 to 40 grams of protein at every single meal, plus some healthy vegetables, um, a healthy starch within a, a, like a certain amount, like so you're not having like half your plate filled with, um, you know, white potatoes or something like that or pasta. I don't mind people having some sweet flavor in their life because it also makes the process of dealing with all of this more enjoyable when we're actually able to enjoy some foods instead of taking it all away from everyone. So anywho, um, that is, is what I will share for today. Um, we will talk more about diet and all sorts of supplements and all sorts of things uh, the next time. I wanted to keep this pretty focused on candida testing. So I hope this is helpful. Please leave me any more of your candida testing questions in the comments. Please, if you're new to my channel, like this video. And especially if you liked this and you want me to do more on Candida, please like this video. It helps me know that this is helpful for you and you want me to develop more content for you. And then make sure if you don't subscribe to my channel, please subscribe. It really means a lot. We produce daily content and share it here. And we're constantly trying to bring new, innovative, helpful information to a community that really, really, really needs it to help you live a better life. So thank you guys so much for tuning and I really deeply appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you again soon. We'll do these, this uh, Ask Me Anything again very soon.